thank you everyone for joining. This is the first uh, virtual International Institute Roundtable of fall 2021. I'm Mary Gallagher and I am the director of the International Institute. The International Institute is the unit on campus at the University of Michigan that brings together area studies units and other programming and centers on international and global issues. I'm just gonna very briefly introduce uh, the moderator of today's event. Uh, that is Professor Pauline Jones. She is a professor in the political science department and she's also the director of the digital Islamic studies curriculum, which is housed at the International Institute. The uh, round table today is sponsored by a number of different uh, centers and units at the International Institute, the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies, the Center for Russia, Eastern European and Eurasian Studies, the Center for South Asian Studies, and the Digital Islamic Studies curriculum. I'm really happy to be here and share with you this great roundtable on Afghanistan. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Mary. Um, well, welcome. I want to welcome you all to the uh, first PI roundtable of the fall. And thank you, uh, alongside Mary, for joining us. Um, the reason we put together this roundtable is that it, it's frankly difficult, if not impossible, to underestimate the significance of the war in Afghanistan. It lasted for two decades, it spanned four different presidential administrations, cost an estimated $2 trillion, and killed nearly 2,500 US servicemen and servicewomen, and at least 50,000 Afghan civilians. So needless to say, this has been a costly war. And we have brought together four prominent experts to discuss the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, the resurgence of the Taliban, what this means for the future of Afghanistan and Afghanis, and the broader implications for both the surrounding region, particularly South Asia and Central Asia, as well as for combating terrorism. This is really truly an outstanding group of experts and I'm so grateful to all of them for being here. I'm gonna briefly introduce these panelists in the order they will speak. Each of them will speak for approximately 10 minutes. And after they conclude all the remarks, we will open the discussion to the audience for questions and comments. Please use the chat uh, to ask your questions. We will be monitoring them throughout the round table. First, Antonio Bistosi is a visiting scholar at King's, London, King's College London and the author of numerous works on the Taliban and Afghan state building, including the critically acclaimed and quite timely Taliban at War, 2001 to, 2000, to 2018. In addition to his many academic credentials, he has served with United Nations Assistance Mission to Afghanistan from 2003 to 2004. Susan D. Page is a professor of practice in international diplomacy at the Gerald R. R. Ford School of Public Policy and a professor of practice at the University of Michigan Law School. She has deep expertise in international relations, particularly in Africa, and served in numerous senior level roles, such as the first US ambassador to newly independent South Sudan and deputy assistant secretary of state for African affairs. Javed Ali is an associate professor of practice at the Ford School of Public Policy. He is a former senior director for counterterrorism at the National Security Council with over 20 years of professional experience on national security and intelligence issues in Washington, D.C. He served in the, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, among other important U.S. agencies. And finally, Wong Cole is a public intellectual, prominent blogger and essayist, and the Richard P. Mitchell Collegiate Professor of History at the University of Michigan. For almost four decades, he has sought to put the relationship of the West and the Muslim world in historical context in works such as his most recent, Muhammad, Prophet of Peace Amid the Clash of Empires, published in 2018. He has written extensively on Egypt, Iraq, and South Asia. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much. We'll turn first to our first panelist. Thank you. So I'll, uh, I've been asked to uh, talk about the Taliban and uh, of course there's a lot to say about the Taliban. So I'd like to be rather focused on uh, what I say. Uh, I'm not gonna spend much time talking about the past. I think probably everybody is more interested about the present and the future. I will only say that, uh, you know, it's obvious the Taliban started their uh, career uh, as an ultra conservative movement and organization. Um, and, uh, you know, we respected after so many years of war, especially the last 20 years of war, uh, 
the, you know, some degree of um, radicalization of the Taliban would take place within the rank and file in particular, uh, simply as a result of, you know, war and killing, you know, uh, war usually doesn't bring moderation. Um, so, you know, in a sense, we could say that if you look at the average Talib, you know, uh, within the ranks is probably more radical than it was in the 90s, where, you know, they were not perceived as, uh, as extreme or, or as radical. Um, having said that, you know, the Taliban evolved for sure uh, over the last 20 years in a number of ways. The most significant ones are, uh, as what they've seen in the last few months militarily, they have certainly become much more sophisticated and they have learned to fight in what today we call uh, uh, hybrid uh, warfare, you know, hybrid, they deployed hybrid tactics. They're not as sophisticated as capable as the masters of hybrid tactics, which is Hezbollah of Lebanon. But anyway, you know, they, they've gone quite a long way in that direction. Uh, from what I've seen and heard, I think that much of it comes from the uh, Revolutionary Guards of Iran that have agreed to transfer know-how to them. You know, there is some of the Taliban all learning, but some key skills have been transferred by, uh, by the Iranians. Whatever the case, they have the skills now, and they deploy them to great effect on the battlefield uh, over the last three or four months. Then there's been uh, another important evolution in that the Taliban now, internally, are a much more pluralistic uh, organization and essentially led in a collegial way by their leadership. So it's not like the Taliban of the 90s, which were essentially led by an autocrat. You know, Mullah Omar was not very sophisticated, but the way he ran the organization was autocratic. He was deciding, he was listening to people, but basically he was taking all the decisions and that, you know, was, you know, uh, there was no, no voting, you know, no, no, no consultation. Um, now, especially the current leader, uh, uh, Mullah Abatullah, is, uh, has been ruling the Taliban in a much more uh, collegial way. So, you know, although it's still the one that decides, now the Taliban have, what I would call, the same they wouldn't like this, you know, but I would call it a Politburo, so a collegial leadership structure, which actually votes on key issues, you know. So on key issues, uh, the leader calls for a vote. And there's been cases where Abatullah has been put in a minority. You know, typically, uh, Abatullah, of course, is there because he's a rather shrewd politician, if you like. So normally avoids situation where he's, he's gonna be in a minority. Uh, and, you know, it will postpone or delay a vote until there's a majority, but that involves still, in any case, a lot of lobbying, a lot of compromising, and essentially forms by forming coalitions, uh, or has been a ruling, uh, forming coalitions, you know, before the Taliban took power. So essentially, uh, he has to make sure that the majority of the members of the Rebbe Shura supports him, supports his policies, which meant in practice that he formed rather wide coalitions involving uh, people sometimes from the, let's call it left of the movement, so the moderates, from the right of the movement, so the hardliners, is himself as a centrist, you know. Um, perhaps we could describe it as slightly center left in Taliban terms. Um, and so recently had a coalition that included quite a few hardliners as well, because he didn't have enough support uh, on the left and the center of the movement to, to get his policies through. So that means that there is a dynamic within the Taliban at the, at the leadership level. It's not simply that there's one guy taking decision or even a small leadership that's simply deciding. You know, there are a lot of debates, constant debates, as we've seen in these um, weeks after the fall of Kabul. It took uh, quite a long time for them to form a government. And only today they managed to form one. And there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of discussion there and there's still this is still an acting government so it's not the, the final world. So this is because as I said you know they're not run in an autocratic way anymore. And there are I don't know what you can call them faction, but there are different views, different tendencies within the organization, ideological, the regional groups that want representation. Uh, normally would describe this as grassroots, even democratic demands. The Taliban themselves don't use this word. They, they, they see democracy or democratic as bad words, you know, something imported from the West. But they get these dynamics, these demands on the base of the movement to be represented uh, are intrinsically democratic. Then what they will do with that remains to be seen. You know, the, the list of ministers we just published, some of them are not 
well-known quantities, so we'll take some days to fully assess what this means in practice. Uh, ideologically, uh, the core of the Taliban, I think, has not evolved a lot. Uh, what happened is that the, those leaders who were exposed to the world, so because they negotiated with foreign diplomats or because they traveled, and they did travel a lot, you know, of course they know Pakistan well by now, but they've been spending quite a lot of time in Iran, in the Gulf, uh, they traveled to Central Asia, to China, to Russia a lot. They've been also some of them to Europe, you know. Um, and they met diplomats from not only from America during the Doha talks, but from a variety of countries in, in Doha and elsewhere. So they, they've been exposed, you know, to the rest of the world. They have a better understanding of what is allowable, not allowable, what Afghanistan as a state might need in terms of even surviving, you know, I don't say uh, prospering, but in terms of survival, they understand now Afghanistan as a landlocked country needs to uh, engage with the neighbors, first of all, but also beyond the neighbors with the rest of the world. So this is a, is a pragmatic, savvy leadership that learned a lot out of experience. Otherwise, you know, ideologically, the movement has not changed a lot because they didn't really have a lot of debates about ideology. There's some practical debates about how to organize things in areas under their own control. So girls' education, for example, dealing with NGO, these are things that they debated because you know they had to uh, take practical decisions. Uh, the more they expanded, the more they took territory under control. Uh, and then an important thing, they've been absorbing, of course they've been expanding, and the expansion to a large extent came through the incorporation of networks which were not originally Taliban. So um, especially when they expanded eastwards, westwards, and northwards, they incorporated people from different ideological backgrounds, largely people coming from Muslim Brother type organizations. In Afghanistan, the Muslim Brothers split already in the 70s, so there are a variety of groups and organizations that have that kind of origins. Some of them don't have much left of the original ideology, they became uh, ethnic parties or catch all parties, basically interested in power, not much else, not ideology. Others have been more, you know, they stayed closer to the original ideology. Anyway, many of these guys uh, joined the Taliban after 2001, you know, um, and some of them reached relative senior position. The guy was, was just appointed chief of staff of the army, was a top um, Tajik commander of the Taliban in the Northeast. Uh, it is a former commander of Jamiat Islami, which is one of these parties. Uh, many people in the East and the Taliban are from the Islamic Party, which is a movement broad organization, and uh, they didn't seem to have made it to any senior appointment, but many of their commanders uh, are from that, uh, from that background. So that, I think, had some impact on their way of thinking, and even the Akhanis originally were not part of the Taliban, and their ideology is somewhat different from that of the Taliban themselves. Um, and they are much more at ease with, for example, modern technology than the Taliban. You know, the Taliban are much clumsier still, especially the southern Taliban with uh, modern technology. The Kanis have demonstrated over the years, you know, they're quite conversant with technology. There are more uh, people educated uh, at the university level, especially engineers with the Kanis, for example, than with the southern Taliban. In the East also, there are a lot of educated Taliban. But educated mean not just educated in seminars, but also exposed to uh, secular education. So high school at least, but often I've been to college, you know, and therefore they have a different approach, a different understanding. So I think I'm already speaking probably for too long, but the, the last thing I wanted to say is that um, now the big debates about the future are formation of a coalition government. The Taliban made clear today that this government that they introduced, of course it's not a coalition, it's Taliban only, but is acting, it means that they're still negotiating over a coalition, so they haven't at least formally given up on forming a coalition, one. Uh, and uh, uh, two, uh, clearly this delay has highlighted the degree to which there are still internal issues within the Taliban, issues of uh, uh, representation. Um, of course, our struggles, you know, can see them uh, both, both ways. Um, there are actors in the Taliban who traditionally have not been represented at the leadership level, they want more space. Um, and not all of them have been satisfied by this cabinet, although we still have to make a full assessment of that. So I think this issue remains open. 
you know there will still be people in the future will uh, raise demands there will be people will be dissatisfied at uh, the various levels now this is the cabinet but even in the appointment of governors in the provinces dissatisfied people have made clear they're not happy some of them for example in Nanga have defected already to the Islamic State for example to, to express their dissatisfaction so this dynamics will be very important in the future uh, and might have a, an impact on the stabilization of, uh, of the country so I will stop here as I just been told that I passed my 10 minutes time. Thank you so much. Uh, let's turn now to Ambassador Page. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, Antonio, for uh, getting us started. Uh, I think it's important that we stress that, um, and, and I'm glad that the news media seems to finally be moving away from some of the talk about the uh, the departure, the withdrawal of uh, US, NATO and allied forces from Afghanistan, because that obscures the 20 year war um, uh, and discusses really a, obviously a very unpleasant part of the war, which is its end, um, but doesn't allow us to analyze what we were doing and where our objectives met and actually trying to analyze what we could do better in the future. So I'll just mention a couple of points because I, I would really like to hear the questions from the audience. Um, I think a lot has been said about were the objectives met. Um, and you know we have to go back and remember that the immediate United States objective in 2001, uh, the reason for invading um, uh, Afghanistan ostensibly was to destroy Al Qaeda's networks uh, of terrorism. And really, um, I would certainly say that the Taliban was a secondary target that, uh, yes, they were hosting Al Qaeda, but they were not the main target. Eventually, they became also the reason for uh, remaining in Afghanistan and going after them uh, as well. But I would really just like to stress one act, aspect, which uh, is a comment that someone made. I attended the 2019, um, the, it was the 19th annual Doha Forum on uh, Dialogue. And uh, Jane Harmon, who was at the time the CEO of the Wilson Center, made a great comment, which is a war on terror or a war on terrorism is a war on a tactic. And we don't often stop to think what we are doing when we try to wage war against a, an amorphous target. Um, and that means that when it's amorphous, it is not very well defined. And I believe that that was one of the biggest problems of the war in Afghanistan is that we had one objective, um, destroy Al Qaeda's bases and base of operations in Afghanistan, uh, kill or capture senior um, Al Qaeda leaders who were responsible for the um, 2001 uh, attacks on the World Trade Center. Um, but it then became something different, which was also to uh, push out the Taliban regime, put in, and Antonio just alluded to this, a sort of coalition government, or at least a new transitional government, uh, which was established. But we could have possibly left at that point. Um, even though bin Laden was not captured at the very beginning of the uh, attempts to um, destroy the bases and senior leadership, once he was captured and killed, why didn't we leave? Why are we not looking at the all, I mean, we are, but it would be great if our policy makers actually took the time to read all of the reports from the inspector, the special inspector general uh, for Afghanistan reconstruction. Those reports and interviews are extremely telling. 
And I'm glad that they've been published and um, are of course available now, um, uh, most of them without redaction, because um, it's important to step back and try to understand what we did wrong so that perhaps the next time we might do things better. But countries, uh, certainly the United States, we don't have a very good history of learning from our history. And I'm not going to say the same, you know, we're, we're doomed to repeat it, but, but we are. And I think one of the challenges going forward as the Taliban has now announced its um, government, again, uh, at least a few of the leaders, I'm sure that Javed will talk about uh, the new Minister of Interior uh, who is on the FBI uh, list, wanted list. But it would be great if we could think about um, what one writer called the failure of the three C's, the failure of control, the failure to understand the culture and the failure to compromise. So these are not my words, I am quoting someone um, that was just in a recent foreign policy article, but I think it's important because even when talking to educated people, the belief is that the United States brought liberation to Afghanistan's women and uh, delivered them equality or greater freedom and the ability to uh, go to school and participate in public life. But that's only because we don't know the longer history of Afghanistan and the fact that women were participating in public life um, and that women had been educated before the Taliban, I'm not talking about every woman and all over the country, um, because like in so many countries and Afghanistan with the size and the uh, geography, people are living in very rural areas as well, mountainous regions. And we tend to talk about the bigger cities and not the rural population that didn't have opportunities pre-Taliban, didn't have opportunities post-Taliban uh, under the um, Karzai government or, or others, um, and their way of life continued uh, largely unchanged. But I think it would behoove us to understand the ideology and the belief system, which from the Western perspective, just like with, say, communism, um, we don't understand the mentality of a, a different set of rules that for us are just so foreign that they are somehow wrong. So um, I would hope that we could learn from the mistakes in not having a very clear agenda, a shifting agenda, and this happens all the time where we start off with one objective and then it morphs into something else because um, once we've started down that road, it's very hard to turn and, uh, and say, okay, mission accomplished, we need to leave. So I will stop there and um, look forward to hearing uh, my other panelists and to discussing um, how we can go forward with the new relationship, whatever that's going to be uh, diplomatically and uh, with the Taliban and um, the humanitarian situation in the country as well. Thank you. Thank you, that was a great way to bring us to the, the bigger picture. Uh, Professor Ali. Thanks, uh, Paulina. Thanks, Mary, as well, for having me or having me uh, here this uh, afternoon. Great to share the virtual stage with so many world-class scholars and, and experts. Um, and for my uh, remarks, I'd like to hone in on the terrorism issues and the counterterrorism issues. And that was the world I lived professionally in Washington, D.C. before I started teaching here at Michigan and now kind of my academic focus. So I'll leave the, the bigger picture issues to others as, as Susan and Antonio and probably Professor Cole will get into. But um, from the 
the terrorism perspective, and Susan has already talked about this, we, the United States and the West shifted its initial objectives post 9-11 from narrow counterterrorism to going after Al Qaeda and finding those responsible for the 9-11 attacks. And I was in Washington, DC the morning of 9-11 and that day is forever etched in my mind um, versus the mission as it morphed into something completely different that went well beyond the scope of the original intent of the counterterrorism campaign. And as someone who was in the trenches of the US government's counterterrorism fight in a bunch of different departments and agencies, Pauline, as you mentioned, I, for one, always found that mystifying. At what point were those policy decisions being made way above my pay grade to, to change that focus? But here we are now, 20 years later, and I would argue the terrorism environment in Afghanistan post the, the US and Western withdrawal still looks daunting. It is not to say, though, that what remains of Al Qaeda and what remains, or not what remains, but we actually have seen a demonstration of capability with ISIS Khorasan, you know, sadly, a couple of weeks ago with the, the horrific attack in Kabul. There are those groups that are still active on the ground in Afghanistan and have not been militarily defeated, despite an enormous amount of pressure put on both Al Qaeda and now, and now ISIS and, and even the Taliban. So from a terrorism threat perspective, the landscape is still daunting. The groups may not have the direct ability to, to threaten the West the way certainly Al Qaeda did pre and um, in the first years after 9-11, but it doesn't mean there aren't, they, they can't be threats or they can't conduct attacks. And again, the ISIS-K attack is a demonstration of a, a local capability that ISIS Khorasan could probably replicate day in, day out in multiple places in Afghanistan if given the opportunity and the time and space. Al-Qaeda is, I think, a bit of a different story. And the US government also, uh, for uh, listeners or, or viewers, those who aren't familiar, there is a, a list the State Department manages called the Foreign Terrorist Organization List. And that is a list of uh, terrorist organizations the US government designates. And then through that designation, uh, there are a number of tools and authorities that can be applied against uh, those groups. If you were to take that list uh, right now, I and mean, there's at least 20 plus groups on that list, many of them, if not half of them, are active in Afghanistan or across the border in Pakistan. So that to me suggests that the threat environment is still significant, even with our departure. And then turning to the counterterrorism aspect of this, if the threat environment is still relatively high, um, what does that landscape look like? Because now with the US withdrawal, uh, that means that counterterrorism infrastructure that was in place for 20 years to go after Al Qaeda or ISIS Khorasan or other groups that were threatening Afghan stability or US interests um, locally or in the region, that's for the most part gone. And what you hear the Biden administration uh, say is that the US will continue to maintain um, counterterrorism capabilities and, in, and an infrastructure, but it is now over the horizon or offshore. And the strikes uh, over the past couple of weeks uh, in Afghanistan against um, apparently ISIS-K plotters involved with the, the horrific uh, attack at the Kabul airport is a demonstration of our counterterrorism counter capability, but that is those are few and far between. We're not going to have the ability um, to maintain a higher level of pressure on these groups the way we were before. And so with that being the case, who now is left to pick up that slack from the counterterrorism perspective. And at least in the short term, I think the answer is the Taliban. And one of the important questions in the aftermath of the deal made with the Trump administration in uh, the spring of 2020 and, and the negotiations with the Biden administration going forward, will the US or the West enter into a new counterterrorism partnership with the Taliban to go after these groups that threaten both US and Western interests and the Taliban's interests or, or local Afghan interests. And that is a scenario that a lot of people probably couldn't have envisioned up until uh, a year ago. We've seen these counterterrorism partnerships work in other parts of the world, in, in Syria, uh, in East Africa, and North Africa, where the US will support a local partner on the ground, um, not even at a state level, and, and provide um, different types of support. But the boots on the ground are not going to be US troops or, or other US government forces. They will be these local um, forces or, or proxy forces. 
So that is one option I would have to think that is on the table with the Biden administration is, will we enter into a formal counterterrorism agreement with the Taliban so it can put the pressure on ISIS Khorasan and Al Qaeda and other jihadist groups that are active um, in the region to keep Afghans safe and to keep our interests safe and potentially even prevent homeland threats from, from emanating, emanating. Now, whether the Taliban will um, fully embrace that uh, uh, agreement if, if one comes uh, about, whether they have the will to do or even the, the operational capability, I know it's kind of a, a narrow way of looking at things, but these are all really important questions that people need to think about going forward. Because if it's not the Taliban, then who is it going to be? Because again, the US has, has withdrawn and, and a lot of the Western infrastructure is gone as well. So in my mind, we've got lots of questions to think about both on the terrorism threat perspective and the counterterrorism perspective. So let me end with that. Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Professor Fultz, our last speaker on the panel. On the panel. Uh, they say that uh, you're muted is now the most uh, commonly spoken phrase in the world. Um, uh, it's an honor to be here uh, with uh, uh, these distinguished uh, as speakers, many of whom have deep uh, experience uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, I'm not exactly an armchair scholar, but kind of like Moses in the promised land, I was never able to get to Afghanistan. I was uh, doing a student uh, trip in the Middle East uh, in the mid 70s and we wanted to go to India and we decided that we just didn't have time to go to Afghanistan so we flew from Iran to India and we thought to ourselves well we can always go to Afghanistan some other time. Uh, and then just a couple of years later it became impossible to go to Afghanistan uh, because there was a communist government and uh, uh, then uh, in, um, in the early 80s, I was in Peshawar in Pakistan, and um, it wouldn't have been a good time to go to Afghanistan then either. And uh, I, do, I did meet and hang around with a lot of Afghans at that time. Uh, some were Hazara Shiites, and I first encountered them in a park in Peshawar uh, and couldn't figure out who they were. It was kind of looked East Asian, then I listened and they were speaking Persian. Uh, and so I, I finally started talking to them in Persian and, uh, and uh, they told me that they were Hazara and they had horror stories about what made them refugees. Uh, so I've always kind of been at the edges of Afghanistan. I've been in Iran and been in Pakistan. I've been in Uzbekistan, but I've never quite been there. Uh, let me uh, start my remarks just by a quote. Um, from a Bush administration official uh, reported by Ron Suskind. The aide said that guys like me were in what we call the reality-based community, which he defined as people who believe that solutions emerge from your ju judicious study of discernible reality. Well, that sounds like the University of Michigan. Uh, that's not the way the world works really anymore, he said. We are an empire now. And when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality judiciously as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too. And that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors and you, all of you will be left to just study what we do. Uh, this has been attributed to um, uh, Bush's uh, campaign advisor, uh, Karl Rove. Uh, I think that's ridiculous. This is the statement of, of a Trotskyite. Uh, this is a statement, uh, it's, it's basically right Hegelianism. Uh, synthesis emerges from antinomies. Uh, and uh, I think it's almost certainly Paul Wolfowitz, whose parents were, were, were Trotskyites. Um, it, it, you will notice that there's no statement, no, no statement in there about how well 
they create reality. The, the power to create reality seems to have overwhelmed this person. And of course, if you're the, at the helm of a superpower, you can create reality. You just might not create a very good reality. And I think we have seen with uh, the forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, that they didn't in fact create a very good reality. Uh, they set things up for failure. Uh, and we'll go on studying them uh, for a long time, mainly with regard to how deeply they failed. Uh, so the first thing to say about the Afghanistan war uh, and, and the long-term US uh, presence in that country is that it was wholly unnecessary. Uh, I think there was a genuine counter-terrorism threat uh, that needed to be dealt with or a terrorism threat that needed to be dealt with by counter-terrorism. Uh, Al-Qaeda couldn't be allowed to keep its training bases uh, from which it had mounted the 9-11 attack and the Taliban were not cooperating and closing those bases and dissociating themselves from Al-Qaeda. Some were intermarried. Al-Qaeda was in fact the 55th Brigade of the Taliban. It wasn't an outsider, it wasn't a guest. They were colleagues and the, the main uh, progress that the Taliban made against the Northern Alliance was made through the 55th Brigade. Uh, so I, I think it, it, you know, the initial actions of the US in Afghanistan were, were justified. However, staying beyond 2002 made no sense at all. I interviewed one US government official who said that uh, it was because as the Iraq war was on the horizon and there were US allies like Canada that were refusing to participate, uh, that having a, a continued presence in Afghanistan and bringing in some elements of NATO was a way of giving them something to do since they weren't on board with the, the big Bush project uh, of Iraq. Uh, and then there's obviously a lot of mission creep. Once the US was invested in this presence in Afghanistan, it, it went on growing over time. We ended up with nearly 100,000 troops there at one point. Um, and I think one of the big reasons that no president, including Obama, who campaigned on getting out of Afghanistan in 2008, actually pulled out until now, was that everybody was uh, petrified that if they pulled out and there were a big bombing in, in the United States, clearly directed from Afghanistan, that it would be the end of that administration. Uh, so, Obama allowed himself to be convinced uh, by uh, maximalists like David Petraeus and Stanley Crystal that if only he would give them a few more billions of dollars and only he would give them three years, why they could turn this around. And all you have to do is go back and read General Westmoreland's speeches in 1967 uh, to, to see the same trick pulled on, on the Johnson administration uh, just a, a year before uh, the NBN Fu. So uh, it's not actually true that they can always win if only you gave them more billions of dollars and more, uh, more time. Uh, and the other thing to say is that Afghanistan is not important. Um, it's, um, it's GDP nominal is 19 billion. I said billion, not trillion, 19 billion dollars a year. It's in the same league with Trinidad and Tobago and Zambia. I don't think any of us, I mean, it might be a nice vacation. I don't think any of us feel a dire need to occupy those countries. And that's my third point, which is this was a military occupation. The United States doesn't believe in imperialism and people don't, aren't comfortable with the language of imperialism except for Wolf of Wetz or Rove or whoever that was. But uh, from the point of view of the Afghan people, this was an occupation. And in an occupation, you can always find some people who think, well, maybe I'll get something out of the occupation. And you can see that in colonial history. I'm a colonial historian in India and uh, Egypt and elsewhere, uh, but 
there are also a lot of people who really resent being occupied. And I think, you know, a lot of people were calling Taliban, uh, 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 as some of the other guests have suggested, uh, aren't really Taliban. They're not, you know, they weren't trained in seminaries in Northern Pakistan. Uh, they are Afghans, they're Afghan nationalists of some sort, usually inflected with a form of Islam, but the nationalism is, is de facto maybe what's driving uh, their opposition. And you can see this in former US allies, like Le Le Jalal al-Din Haqqani, uh, who, who took money from the United States, who, who carried out US suggestions for hitting the Soviets. As soon as the US came in with boats, boots on the ground in Afghanistan in, in 2001 too, uh, Haqqani announced that he would fight them to the death. Same thing is true of, of uh, uh, of Hikmat Yar, uh, and, um, uh, and 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 by the way, uh, Jalal al-Din Haqqani's son Siraj has just been announced as the interior minister of the new newly formed government in Afghanistan. Uh, so people are saying, well, he's on a terror watch list from the United States. Well, because they hit the U.S. embassy, they, the, the Haqqani's uh, were based in North Waziristan and they uh, they were one of the fiercest opponents of the U.S. presence, but it's not uh, it's not ideological to this extent that the Haqqanis were perfectly willing to be compradors of the United States if it was a way of getting rid of the Soviet occupation back in the 1980s. So uh, if the United States had not been an occupier, then the Haqqanis wouldn't have hit it. Uh, and uh, and again, you know, Siraj Haqqani is being called Taliban now, but that's it's really a different organization. Uh, so it, it, it's not an important country. It may or may not have a trillion dollars of minerals. A trillion dollars of minerals for a whole country is not very much. Uh, we have a $28 trillion national debt. Even if we could grab all of the trillion and sell it and keep the money ourselves, that would get us back down to $27 trillion in debt. Uh, we have a, a GDP of, of, of 21 trillion a year. So it's not important. It's not important geopolitically. It's important to India, it's important to Iran, it's important to Pakistan, it's important to Uzbekistan, and we should long ago have left it to them. Thank you so much, Juan. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and ask the first question. We don't have any questions uh, lining up yet in the Q&A. Um, and I wanna ask it to uh, uh, Antonio, um, so especially since you need to, I know you need to leave at, at one. Um, you know, you mentioned many ways in which the Taliban has evolved. Um, one of them, maybe the most significant way, being is it's no longer an autocratically run organization. It's more internally democratic, if you will. Uh, I wonder if you could say something about how that might impact uh, the possibility of negotiating with the Taliban. A couple of our speakers have mentioned um, that, you know, the Taliban might be a, a willing partner in, in counterterrorism. Uh, I know that uh, other countries in the region, namely Uzbekistan, has been uh, negotiating with the Taliban uh, about future uh, counterterrorism efforts. I wonder if you could say something about uh, the Taliban as a reliable, credible negotiating partner. Well, uh, I think, I suppose, you know, the impact is probably the, you know, positive in some way and negative in other ways. So, in fact, it becomes more negotiating with the Taliban becomes more like negotiating with any other, you know, any typical counterpart we know from our experience in, in Western countries. So within the Taliban, then there are uh, open factions and lobbies that push in one direction or the other. So whatever the Taliban might say or do, there will always be somebody unhappy. So the, the hard line is we are not happy when the negotiations in Dover are going on. Uh, they have not been happy recently. Uh, they want more power. They are against um, uh, cutting off links with global jihadists or even corralling them uh, in kind of reserves, you know, uh, where they wouldn't be uh, represent a danger to the neighboring countries, etc. And so on and so forth, you know. And some of them are against a war against the Islamic State, though the Islamic State anyway doesn't want this negotiation with the Taliban in any case. Uh, and there might be other, other uh, interests that they represent. On the other hand, 
uh, even when uh, different times, you know, Taliban policies are veering towards military confrontation, you had a lobby of uh, Taliban leaders who were more connected, more wired into the communities inside Afghanistan, who of course were more influenced by these communities and they were against more fighting, more war, because of course the community were suffering, you know, especially areas most affected by the violence. This community would put pressure on the Taliban for uh, talking, for negotiations, or would put pressure on them to have uh, for, for the Taliban to allow more NGOs to operate in the areas and so on and so forth, you know. Or for example, for the Taliban not to target members of the security forces, you know, we're going on leave, etc. This was in the past when the Taliban were in the position. So the dynamics have changed, in a sense, become more complicated. Uh, I, you know, I think there is less of a chance of the Taliban taking some uh, sudden arbitrary decision. Uh, there's much more internal discussion, negotiations. So they tend to steer toward what for them is the center. Of course, it's not our center, it's their center, you know. So basically, <clears throat> the different lobbies have access to the leadership, and the leadership tends to find some kind of balance position that tends to represent um, to various degrees, you know, the different factions. Of course, you can see from the cabinet that has been appointed, the softeners still uh, take the lion's share, but there is something for the others too, you know? And that's the result of what they assess as being the actual power and influence of the different uh, regional factions and different individual leaders. So in a sense, it makes them more predictable, not necessarily easy to deal with, but at the same time, once you reach an agreement, it should be, you know, easy to have the agreement uh, respected because, you know, the moment you have an agreement that's been negotiated, you create a lobby within the organization that is in favor of the agreement, you know? So then they will put pressure for that agreement to, to be represented. I would say the typical dynamics you have with collegial leaderships is that they tend to be more stable and predictable. Whereas a single leader sometimes can do a very good thing, but you know, he will also do from time to time a very bad thing, you know. So it's probably something more middle of the way that what you could expect. Thank you. Uh, and before you depart, did you want to add any uh, comment or, or uh, possibly respond to some of the things you heard uh, other panelists say? Well, yes, I haven't said much about the uh, global jihadist. Uh, I do have a feeling that you know the entire uh, U.S. Taliban negotiations uh, had taken into account the possibility of collaborating with the Taliban against, in general, global jihadists, specifically against Islamic State. Uh, but of course, the issue of Al Qaeda was raised. I understand the uh, the uh, uh, American diplomats were not entirely happy with the pro proposed solution. Uh, by the Taliban, so the idea of, you know, creating reserves, you know, like for American Indians uh, in, in parts of Afghanistan where these people could stay, but uh, they would not be allowed to carry out raids uh, outside the country. They would have to uh, be registered the Taliban, you know, the exact location that every single member should be registered and kind of monitored by the Taliban. Uh, these are things that not everybody likes, you know, two, three, organization, which the most important one at the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan signed agreement with the Taliban over this. So they agreed to this, I understand reluctantly because there are no options. Um, I think, you know, we be for the Taliban to fully implement this with the entire range of uh, groups linked to Al-Qaeda in the country, um, uh, which there are several, of course, mostly quite small. Uh, so I think there will be, the issue will arise for the Taliban what to do, you know, with groups that don't want to sign and again with that. I think they had internal discussions. There were people who argued, you know, regardless of what you know, Americans want or not, if, if the foreign volunteers don't respect our rules, we should act on them. Uh, I, I think uh, informally, many of these foreign volunteers being advised to leave. That was at the time when the US Taliban negotiation was going particularly well. And then of course, we know that things derailed somewhat in, in more recent months. So now most of them are waiting uh, to see what happens. Um, but for the Taliban, there is this option you know, of encouraging as many as possible to leave, go somewhere else. Uh, those who, who don't want to sign agreements before they take any action, they know the moment they take action, they will drive these people and groups toward the Islamic State, which is not what they would want in any case right now. 
Thank you again for, for being with us today and for sharing your expertise. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. And Thank bye -bye. you. We have a, a question uh, uh, for um, Susan Page. Um, the question is with regard to the failure to understand culture and the Afghani way of life. Uh, and this, the uh, person who asked the question would like to know, uh, would this speak to cultural relativism? If so, should there be limitations to this approach? At what point, if ever, should foreign organizations intervene on potentially harmful practices? If others want to also comment on this question, uh, I think that would be fine, but I will start with, uh, with Ambassador Page. Thank you. Um, I, I won't call it so much cultural relativism uh, because I don't think it's necessarily trying to, well, we, we do tend to go in and try to decide what is uh, normal, what is respectful, what is right, um, but rather, for us to actually have a better appreciation for other cultures, norms, um, and customs. So that when you think about even just being a tourist somewhere, generally speaking, we try to go to a place because we want to learn about the history of a, um, of how they built or uh, architecture or something. Um, but when we are talking suddenly about foreign affairs, international affairs, somehow all of that goes out the window. And it is, I mean, understandably, all countries are going to act in what they believe is their self-interest, their best interests, um, protection of their citizens and the homeland, et cetera. Um, I mean, Professor Cole has already touched upon the fact that, well, but realistically, did this even make sense at the beginning in terms of just geopolitically, economically? Um, but we tend not to think of the other reasons. We do sometimes when we're trying to justify uh, a reason for invading or occupying, but we didn't necessarily know. I mean, I'm talking now with this sort of big top level uh, of policymakers. Did we really know what was happening with women's education? No. Um, I mean, we knew what people told us and the people on the ground who were doing things, but we always assume that we are going in with, we have good intentions, but other people's intentions are not good. So I often like to think about who does the naming, who gets to call something what it is. That's really powerful. That's where the power lies. And so, um, you know, if we try to think about why certain cultures and traditions develop, um, they usually develop out for, for reasons that have evolved over time. And if you take something away that has a significance in that society, you normally need to replace it with something else that would be, if the idea is to, um, alleviate harm or eliminate harm, then you need to replace it with something that would be less harmful. Again, who decides what is harmful, um, but that could also still be um, culturally, socially relevant um, to take the place of the thing that is being taken away. So for instance, just as one example, we talk about uh, female genital mutilation. Well, of course, societies that practice it, that's not what they call it. Um, that's a term that was brought in from elsewhere. That's those, that language is, um, is if you want to say normative, I mean, it is trying to define that this is not a a correct or a right practice, and therefore it is mutilating the body. 
Um, again, one could have arguments about whether that's good or bad, and there are plenty of those discussions going on, but why are those practices in place? And so just simply banning it, well, then what are you doing to those, um, let's say, girls and women who, in order to find an appropriate husband, are now going to be ostracized from society? What additional problems are you creating by just simply taking something away? So there are all kinds of uh, issues. I mean, that's that's sort of a big one, but um, I think that we do need to learn more. Uh, I think some countries do a better job at trying to understand that, but um, we like to go in and think that we are saving people and saving them from the harm that their evil governments or uh, other members of society are, are uh, doing to them. And that justifies our intervention, even if it had nothing to do with the, re the real reason that we either went in or have stayed in. Pauline, I'll just, I'd like to just jump on quickly on the points that um, Susie made and sort of this inability, repeated inability, uh, unfortunately, um, to not understand different cultures and histories and customs and, and religions and ethnicities, you know, the makeup of these very complex societies that we're thinking about now uh, intervening in you know, not only militarily, but diplomatically and economically. I think these are the, when the history books are written and Professor Cole and other scholars, you know, continue to do their work, these are the sins of both Iraq and Afghanistan. In both countries, we just fundamentally did not truly appreciate the gravity of what we were getting ourselves involved in as we double down, as, as Susan was saying, administration by administration. And that, to me, as someone, again, who was inside government, watching it unfold was just um, really staggering to see because we couldn't, we couldn't learn from the mistakes even as we were making the mistakes. And I don't know um, what it will take for us to not do this again in the future, but my hope is that with all what has you know, occurred over these past 20 years in both countries, that we won't do this again. But you know, fingers crossed that, you know, there's at least a silver lining um, from that aspect going forward. Thank you. Um, there is another question that is um, going to take us uh, also to uh, sort of US policy uh, and broader implications of the withdrawal. Mary Gallagher asks, uh, pundits in China have speculated that the US withdrawal from Afghanistan is sending a broader message about the US's lack of commitment to allies and places like Taiwan. What is the likely impact of the Afghan withdrawal on global views of US foreign policy? So here, here is a question about the credibility of the US as a negotiating partner, as opposed to my question about the Taliban as a credible negotiating partner. Um, would, would any of our panelists like to, to comment on that question? Juan? You're muted, Juan. Uh, sure, the, um, the Chinese statement is uh, self-serving propaganda. Uh, great powers uh, don't have friends. Uh, Harry Truman uh, used to say that if you wanted a friend in Washington, buy a dog. Uh, and uh, China itself has gladly thrown people under the bridge. Uh, so. Uh, it's just propaganda. Uh, it's an attempt to demoralize the Taiwanese. And the situations are not similar. Uh, Taiwan actually is important, uh, unlike Afghanistan, geopolitically, uh, economically, and so forth. I, I don't mean to put down Afghanistan. I'm just saying it's, it's, there's no more reason for the United States to have 100,000 troops in Afghanistan than there is for it uh, to have 100,000 troops in, in some of these other countries that I mentioned. Uh, nobody in the United States uh, seems to care so much that uh, Myanmar or Burma had a military coup recently. Uh, one of the policy changes was to demote women in political status, and it was a big setback to women's rights in Myanmar. 
I don't hear congressmen on the floor giving speeches and being upset about the US lack of action to intervene in Burmese society to reconfigure the military's conception of women's rights. It's bad. It's bad that women lost rights and the US should do what it can to make sure that the military suffers until those rights are restored. But it should use an economic carrot or stick, not, we don't, we don't need to invade Burma over this. Uh, indeed, uh, everybody in Burma, of course, lost their political rights with the coup. Uh, so uh, the United States hasn't abandoned Taiwan and is not likely to abandon Taiwan. Taiwan is the source of uh, many of those computer chips which are now lacking and which are harming US industry. Our, our colleagues over at Ford and the Rouge River plant have had to cut back on their estimate of how many automobiles they can make because of the world shortage in, in computer chips. Uh, uh, Taiwan ha is, a, is a key element in the, in the world economy and the world supply chain, uh, not only for chips, for, but for other uh, reasons. Uh, computers and, and, and so forth. So uh, it, it's not like Afghanistan and the US isn't militarily occupying Taiwan. Taiwan is very happy to have the US uh, alliance and is upset that the US isn't even closer to Taiwan than it is because there are a lot of politicians who want to do business in China and, and don't want to upset the apple cart by uh, uh, being too close to Taiwan. If, if I could just add one thing, um, I, th I think um, Professor Cole has laid out really quite a good rationale with respect to Taiwan, but maybe just to take it to the slightly more broad question, um, I do believe that uh, the relationship of trust or um, ability to trust in the US government has certainly taken a, a hit over the last several years. I don't wanna make it only about the past um, administration, but because there are lots of pasts. And so any particular group can remember something that was not adhered to. But um, I, I think that certainly on the big scene uh, in the last few years with uh, pulling out of the Iran nuclear deer deal, um, pulling out of the Human Rights Council, um, pulling out of the Paris Climate Change Accord. Now, granted, these are all different types of agreements, treaties versus voluntary uh, participation and whatnot, but nonetheless, with promises that were made, some of which are enforceable uh, in, in other ways, than, than the voluntary ones, of course. But um, this current administration has made a, a, a big um, push and move to say that they are getting back to multilateralism, to diplomacy, to putting diplomacy first before uh, boots on the ground, for instance. And um, I still think that although those were the words, with respect just to the withdrawal um, and the, um, the way that it was handled, this still raises questions, I believe, for a lot of the international community about is this administration putting, um, uh, putting its might behind its words because uh, at least I mean, I'm not there, I'm not on the ground and we only have reports from others, but I'm told that uh, there was very little dialogue with our allies before actually um, deciding to, to uh, withdraw um, and even to change the date. I mean, there are questions about uh, the Biden administration changed a number of agreements, decided that they would at least try to re-enter uh, the JPCOA, the, the, J, um, the um, agreement with Iran. They re-entered the Human Rights Council, um, re-entered the Paris Climate Change Agreement, uh, pushed against 
overturned the, um, the ban on immigrants from majority Muslim countries. So there was no obligation for the Biden administration to accept the agreement that Trump had negotiated. And in fact, even though they did accept it, um, they did unilaterally change the date uh, from May of, of 2021 to August of 2021. So there, there are things that would still make one question and even leaving Bagram Air Base, the government of, of Afghanistan, which was still in place at the time, they were not told. It was sort of a move under cover of darkness from what the reports are saying. Similarly, um, allies being surprised at you know very little notice and all of a sudden uh, we're, we're going. So I think that that does raise a question about how trustworthy um, the US government, and again, trying not to put it on one administration, but administrations, um, which do have the ability to change what has been uh, what has been done before, and that always makes it difficult for uh, long term relationships to know where where you're going to stand. David, did you want to weigh in at all on this question? No, I think um, Professor Cole and Susan covered the waterfront pretty well. Okay, great. I do want to stay on this topic for a little while longer of U.S. foreign policy, maybe U.S. foreign policy blunders, policy making decisions. Uh, a number of you, I think all of you in your remarks mentioned something about uh, mission creep and the problem of, of uh, policy goals shifting over time. Um, uh, Ambassador Page, I think you said it best when you said, you know, we initially we, we, uh, the, the goal was to um, uh, defeat Al Qaeda or break up its, its networks. Uh, and then somehow uh, mission creep over time. By 2003, I, if I remember correctly, George W. Bush uh, announced a Marshall Plan for Afghanistan. So the, the, the policy goals shifted quite dramatically. Could, could any of you say a little bit more, particularly maybe you, Java, given your, your time in the administration and, and Ambassador Page, of course, uh, just about how, how and why we think that happened in the case of, of Afghanistan? Do we have any insight into that? Yes, uh, thanks, Pauline. I'll take a crack at it. May not give you a good answer, but at least I'll take a crack at it. So I was just starting my career in government then. So I was pretty um, junior and I didn't have um, much insight into the White House level of thinking. I was more trying to support uh, policymaking with intelligence analysis from a couple of the different jobs that I had back then. So again, my window into what the White House itself was thinking was was um, was pretty opaque, if, if not clear at all. But again, I was in the counterterrorism world and we were so focused in those early years after 9-11 on stopping the next series of attacks from Al Qaeda, because that was the thing that was really shocking to see. And probably a lot of people don't realize that is that despite the enormous pressure that had been put on Al Qaeda and its then its, its affiliates around the world, the group itself, um, so again, under pressure, was still actively not only thinking about, but trying to launch more attacks against the West or against the US homeland. So when I transitioned from um, the Defense Intelligence Agency to, to the Department of Homeland Security in the mid 2000s, we were still very much focused on counterterrorism as, as the singular objective, not only for DHS, but that seemed to be the mission for the, the number one national security priority for the government, stop whatever uh, Al Qaeda is planning to do next, and again, you can go back and now read about all these different plots that were that were entrained to include a really scary one that that was developing in England in, in August of 2006 that would have been the next sort of follow on to to 9/11 using aircraft as weapons uh, or our aircraft as targets. Anyway, so so why then the Bush administration made that that change to something so dramatically different, and again with a series of goals and objectives that were completely unrealistic given the complex history of Afghanistan and all these other failed attempts by going back to Alexander the Great or the British in the 1830s and then in the 1870s or the Soviets in the 1980s. And these imperial powers were unable to achieve similar kind of objectives about reshaping Afghanistan into a completely different vision. Um, why then did we think we could do it differently or better. And I don't have an answer to that. All I know is what I was sort of seeing from my narrow kind of foxhole, but then seeing the policy shift into a completely different direction. 
Um, I'll say maybe just one one or two quick things. Um, we haven't really talked about, we, we assume it, but we haven't really talked about the creation of institutions in the United States following 9-11. And so, um, I mean, we have to go back and remember the Patriot Act and the creation of Homeland Security. Why didn't we see this coming? Um, how did the Twin Towers just simply collapse like that by planes being flown into, uh, into the towers? Um, and so, you know, again, once you start creating this type of architecture to deal with problems, well, now you have a new um, constituency and that those constituents have to be fed. And so um, even if we try to switch our approach now uh, going forward, well, what do we do with Homeland Security and all of the bits and pieces that have come from a remaking of our our cabinet in 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 effect. So um, I think that that is something that we that we have to look at, and you know whether we call it American exceptionalism or or whatever, we always. I mean, I think I don't think this is necessarily unique to the United States, but you know everyone thinks that they can win that they know what the other person country did wrong and we will do that better we might do that one thing better but it might not be what uh caused the failure of the previous uh regime to uh to succeed so i think that there're a lot of um a lot of missing pieces in in that puzzle and then the last thing is is just simply to to say that um Oftentimes, the policymakers are wonderful thinkers and um, intellectuals, but people like me, who spent you know thirty years on the ground in all of these places, um, it's uh, you're faced with a different kind of reality, and sometimes it's very difficult to convince the people sitting in Washington, even if they've had experience there that the situation is in fact, as you are saying that it is. And the reason that you are ostensibly in that place to be providing at least official Washington with that information that they then discount or don't quite believe because they have a different relationship with the powers or all of which is true, but, um, it, it makes it difficult if the people that you're reporting to are loath to um, take your, your suggestions or guidance. Thank you, Susan. And I think all of us with regional area expertise have had the, that experience, <laughs> um, unfortunately. Uh, speaking of sort of more regional or sort of drilling down to country level experience, there's a question um, for you, Juan, but of course anyone can, can weigh in if they'd like to, but it's directed at, at you. Uh, the question is, what do you believe are the implications and consequences of Taliban rule on Hazari Shia Muslims in Afghanistan? Yeah, very bad. Uh, you know, there are many unpleasant consequences of the U.S. loss of that war. Uh, I think, you know, following on from the previous discussion, uh, if you hang around with military officers very long, you get a sense that demoralizing the enemy is very important to them. Uh, sapping their morale makes it harder for them to fight you. I think that one of the reasons that the U.S. stayed in Afghanistan was that it had formerly been a bastion of Muslim radicalism. Uh, from which Muslim radicals planned out a spectacular, in a negative sense, uh, a, a, a mind-blowing attack on the United States. And that by occupying that place with 100,000 troops, what you were saying is that those people are not important. That was a fluke uh, and that we can roll them up easily. Uh, and they should believe this. Uh, and so they should leave us alone. 
Uh, and, and I think the converse of the, why I say this is the converse of that is that the, the Taliban victory just now will be a morale booster for political Islam in general and even for radical uh, Muslim movements uh, more specifically. Uh, and uh, so there will be people who uh, take joy in this uh, victory, uh, who will persecute minorities all the more uh, virulently. Uh, the Hazara Shiites are a bet noir for the, uh, for the Taliban and for hyper Sunni fundamentalists in general. Uh, uh, ISIL killed a lot of Shiites in Iraq. Uh, it's one of the reasons the Iraqis defeated them so roundly was that the, the esprit de corps of two thirds of the co country was uh, inflamed. Uh, and so I, you know, there were massacres of Hazara under the Taliban regime in the 1990s. I uh, would not be surprised if those recurred. Uh, the only reason that they might not might be that the, the Hazara will try to keep their heads down so as to avoid this uh, eventuality. Uh, and the Taliban are this time hoping for some kind of international uh, recognition, and they're hoping for international monetary fund grants. The United States has sequestered $9 billion of, of Afghan government money. So they may try to avoid acting outrageously by committing the kind of massacres that they did in, in the Hazara region uh, in, in, in the late 90s. Uh, but the Hazara will be discriminated against. There won't be any Hazaras in the government, just as there are no women in the government. Uh, and uh, they will suffer downward mobility. Under uh, the US-backed uh, government in Afghanistan, Hazaras had even risen to become generals. That will not be the case now. Uh, and then, you know, the Shia uh, Hazara refugees in uh, Quetta in Pakistan have been attacked by Taliban there. And you could see there's about 20% of Pakistanis are, are, are Shia. So you could see pogroms against them spearheaded by uh, fundamentalists. Uh, and, and it's gonna be a challenge to the Pakistani government because uh, there's a significant Shia element in the Pakistani parliament who are going to be very upset with Imran Khan if he lets this kind of thing happen. But there now will be an imp impulse to have it happen. Uh, by the, the hyper Sunni fundamentalists. Thank you, Juan. I, we are running out of time. I want to keep this on, a, you know, what's become the new Michigan time, which is that we have to add, uh, we have to end 10 minutes before the half hour or hour so that people can get to their classes and so to speak. But I do want to give our panelists a couple of minutes each to, to, to wrap up, maybe respond to something you weren't able to, or to, to clarify something, or um, just to make a concluding remark. Uh, would you like to start us off, Susan? Sure. Thank you very much. This has been very, uh, very useful, and I, I hope that um, those listening have have gained something. Um, I am uh, waiting and watching to see how how will the Taliban actually uh, govern, and how much of a challenge they will face to governing um, one by the people and two by uh, ISIS. I don't have any words, but um, I'm uh, curious, not in a uh, hopeful way, but um, wondering and waiting what, what uh, will happen and whether or not they will in fact truly be in control of most of the country. Thank you. Uh, I guess, Javid? I'll just pick up on that point um, that Susan made. And I do think this is the moment where the Taliban now will be judged on their ability to govern the country in some responsible way uh, that protects uh, the rights and, and interests of Afghanistan, but also protects other countries' interests, obviously ours from a homeland security perspective. And if they don't, we have seen, or they have seen, the consequences of not being responsible. And one of the reasons why they were attacked after 9-11 was because their Afghanistan was used as a launching pad for this horrific attack against us here in the United States. 
if that were to happen again, I would have to imagine any administration, Democrat or Republican, would hold them just as accountable. So that is a scenario where I could see some kind of military intervention again in Afghanistan. So the, the Taliban has already paid a heavy price for that strategic error once in the past. Now it's a question, were their, will their governance model look like 1996 to 2001, or will it look like some kind of hybrid where they still cling to a very conservative interpretation of Sharia, um, but is also more pragmatic and flexible and doesn't uh, get them in the same trouble that they got into after 9-11. So the jury is still out. I agree with Susan, but it will be fascinating to see how this, this works moving forward. Thank you. And, and Juan? You're muted again, Juan. Uh, command. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, uh, somehow I get automatically muted on this uh, program and, and it doesn't show. Or, anyway, uh, the, the thing to say about uh, the re recent uh, events in Afghanistan uh, is that in the larger uh, scheme of things, uh, they're unlikely to affect the United States very much. In fact, uh, the money we spent on Afghanistan uh, was a drain on our economy. By the way, it's not two trillion. It's probably two trillion in direct costs, but we borrowed the two trillion. And the, the US government takes in about uh, three trillion, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, three trillion a, a year. Uh, and but its budget is four trillion, uh, so we borrow an extra trillion. Mainly, it's the Pentagon budget that we're borrowing. But uh, the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq were were not paid for; uh, they were borrowed. And it's estimated by uh, the, the Center for um, Study of War at Brown uh, that uh, so far we spent six point five trillion in interest uh, on this. Uh, so again, um, th that's a, a, about a, a fourth of the national debt. Uh, so economically, geopolitically, I, I think we were well out of that. And I don't think that there's an enhanced terrorism threat on the United States, although of course terrorism is ever, ever pre present possibility. But the fact is we were never attacked by the Taliban domestically. Uh, I can only think of two Afghans in the United States who, who even tried to commit attacks, uh, and both were Al Qaeda. Uh, and the second one may be influenced by, by ISIL. And it's not by occupying foreign countries that you stop terrorism against yourself. In the case of, of, of Al Qaeda, it was counterterrorism, and thank you, uh, Javed, for your efforts in that. Uh, in, uh, in, in the case of ISIL, um, we deplatformed it. Uh, and, and they had been using stochastic terrorism. They had been floating out ideas on the internet and unstable people were taking them up. As soon as they were banned uh, on the major social media, you will notice we haven't had so many uh, ISIL attacks in the United States. Again, it can happen. But an infrastructural approach where you do better airport security because we had no airport security in 9-11 and Al-Qaeda figured out how to take advantage of that. It was a $500,000 attack. It was very, it was a handful of people that they could do that to us because we were essentially had made ourselves uh, vulnerable. So uh, there are ways and we're finding good ways to, to, to uh, uh, largely prevent these attacks. Uh, and uh, I would say it, 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 it's counterproductive to, to try to occupy countries militarily uh, to achieve what uh, much more uh, targeted techniques can. Uh, and, and so I, I'm not happy about the Taliban being back in control because I think this will give a fillip to the international uh, Muslim far right. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think it it's actually dangerous to the United States to the extent that many pundits are making it out to be. Thank you, Juan. Actually ending on a somewhat hopeful note, um, I would like to, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't conclude by thanking uh, Evan Murphy. He is the program coordinator for the Digital Islamic Studies curriculum and he helped me co-create, co-organize, uh, co-conceive uh, this event.
Uh, I'd also like to th thank Derek Room, who's the program coordinator for the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies for helping us uh, organize this event uh, and co-hosting the event. Of course, all the panelists, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and your time. We really appreciate it. We know how busy you are. And I hope to see you on campus soon. Thank you very much.